introduced to our speaker, uh, is Bruce Kenneth, who is a book design, photography teacher, who lives in England. After earning a BA in Humanities and as an architect and printer, uh, he moved to Austria to study calligraphy and book design with Frederick Nogebauer. Uh, he later translated Nogebauer's mystic art for him to Mars. During the 1980s, he was managing director of Maine's renowned uh, Anthonson Press, and since then has maintained his own studio with clients who uh, ranged from the Folger Speak uh, Shakespeare Library, Boston College Law School, and the Railway Club, and also the other client. Bruce has collected the work of W.E. Wiggins since 1972 and has been writing in lecture and writing since 1980. His comprehensive biography, W.E. Wiggins, A Life in Design, will be published by the Reform Archive in October of this year. Um, there's a, a gallery um, a copy of the, of the book if you're curious to see what that book will look like. You can do that at the end of the talk. It's definitely worth it. So it's, it's a, a very impressive book. It's heartwarming to see this great turnout for Dwiggins. I think he's <coughs> dwelled in the wings for a long time, and now with my book coming out with the wonderful work that Paul Shaw has been doing. There was recently an article in Atlas Obscura. I'm just delighted that he's coming back into prominence. This is, this is his time. And so, I, as Sasha said, I brought it, pasted together, done it, the whole book, and I hope that you will come up afterward and, and look at it, and I can't wait for October. Williams is a multifaceted person with all these different things. We in graphic arts tend to know about his type design, book design, calligraphy, maybe his illustration, his stencil work. But he, uh, he was also a very good marionette artist, and in the puppet world, they know nothing about what's familiar to us. They think all he ever did was engineer and build marionettes. And over the course of his uh, time of marionettes, which was roughly 1930 to World War II. He built about 60 marionettes. He wrote the plays, designed and built the sets, designed the lighting, designed the costumes, engineered the marionettes, just amazing stuff. Uh, another aspect of Dwiggins that many people don't know about is that he was a very accomplished writer of fiction, essays, art criticism. And one of my favorite things about this biography that's coming out is we have 20 pages of his own writings about a couple of his typefaces, about book design, some fiction and fantasy set in the types that he designed for Linotype, cast in hot metal and printed letterpress. And the, the deluxe edition has actual letterpress portfolios of those, but every copy of the book has photographic facsimiles of those pages. So you see his metal type in action expressing his own words, and I'm really happy that he gets a little real estate for his, his writing skills. Uh, another misconception that I at least had is that I met Dorothy Abbey, his assistant, in 1972, and I thought that she'd worked with him for decades. Turns out they only worked together for about 10 years, the last 10 years of Dwiggins' life, and I'm convinced that she extended his life a little bit because she helped him so much with his work. And here's another misconception. If you look at the arc of his life, all of his work in type design falls into that band over on the right, just the last third of his life. He was always a bridesmaid and never a bride, until finally, 1928, when he's 48 years old, he gets to start doing this. So tonight I'm going to talk about the titles that are expressed in red, and then the San Francisco lecture will be the ones in blue. So there are uh, everything from newspaper headline types to uh, all kinds of typewriter types and magazine headline alphabets. And then if you look at 1942, there's this amazing period when he's working on six or seven at once. And then his energies begin to decline a little bit, but he, he does some really interesting work late in the 1940s that I'm going to show you. And then we'll close with some stencil alphabets and a few decorated initials. 
So when he first got out of art school, he was already wanting to be a book printer and to design type, but it took decades for that to happen. He had a client who published workbooks for uh, teachers of arts and crafts, so he made model alphabets for this publisher. These are done in about 1907. And then uh, here's a job that he did for the Girlier Club with this wild decorated O. That's 1911. And then all during the teens, he's cranking out these newspaper ads and, and labels for uh, coffee and, and all kinds of uh, manufactured food items, prepared foods. But look at that capital G in the Golf of Doe. Isn't that wonderful? So he, he did all of this stuff by hand and kind of in the trenches of doing all that lettering, kept thinking about uh, how letter forms ought to be put together in typographic form. Then he started working for paper companies. This is a piece he did for Strathmore. And I'm proud that our book has Strathmore and Sappy paper, and Sappy being the successor to S.D. Warren, because uh, doing his work for both of those companies. And he loved the educational aspect of these paper samples. He, he worked a lot with Watson Gordon, who was S.D. Warren's art director, to show printers how best to treat materials, how to, how to use process. And Warren understood that their needs would be met if the printer's work was really successful every time. So Dwiggins had decades of fun working with the paper companies. And then finally, in 1928, uh, if you think about Letraset, and maybe the phototypositor, if any of you know how that worked. Strip of paper and you expose the letters one at a time. In those days, uh, people had to generate headlines and you either sent out to have somebody hand letter them, which took time and was expensive, or sometimes there was metal display type, but didn't always fit. And what was great about this paper printed resource is that you could buy these types and use them the way later generations used letter set and typositor to set headlines. So Dwiggins was the art director for this project, which was based in Boston. And he designed this type, Boylston, named after the street where he had his studio for a while in the, in the teens in, in Boston. And if you look at the, the uh, numerals, you're seeing already a very characteristic Dwiggins feeling in the two and the five and the nine. So straightforward, classic text type. He then works it up with stencils. He's been exploding with his uh, technology and, and ability to cut stencils in celluloid. So this is uh, a workup for what turned into Boylston. Here I've superimposed those three words lay on advertising are set in Boylston. And you can see that this unidentified piece in the Boston Public Library archive is clearly his sketches. The, the O is a little bit too big, the S is a little bit too big, but overall it's a very pleasing set of letters. Then he's been doing a lot of work for Daniel Berkeley Updike in the Marymount Press since before 1910. And Updike gets this commission to print the Book of Common Prayer for the Episcopal Church. Spent several years doing it. So Dwiggins hand-lettered a, a bunch of initials and artwork for the title page that were made into photo engravings. But he also produced some two-line initials. And these were uh, engraved out of, I have to read this now, John Christensen told me this exact wording. The engravings, photo engravings, were used as masters for growing electro-positive matrices. And then these mats were used to cast the individual sorts. So in a time when real type was made only with metal, this 1928 design for these two-line initials can be thought of as Dwiggins first physical type that he produced. So here it is in use. Around the same time, the Christian Science Monitor in Boston uh, asked him to look at some headline types. So here are a, a bunch of different takes on this. He, you can see there are variations in the R form, 
in how far up that stroke comes vertically on the G. And here it is as printed in the newspaper. What I find curious is that Dwiggins had almost 30 years at this point of solving problems spatially with calligraphy. Look at the spacing of the letters in those three lines. I think he was, I don't know what he was doing that day. Also in the late 20s, he began to play with a serifless Roman. So here are some early sketches. He shot these around. He tried to carry at continental type founders. They weren't interested. Eventually, Linotype, who had signed him up to do the Metro typeface, the multi-weight sans serif. Chauncey Griffith, who was the director of typography there, expressed some interest. And so Dwiggins began to work on this. I don't know how clearly you can see all the numerals, but he's working on the math for the side bearings and the fitting really carefully, already in his first efforts at designing type. He's thinking mechanically about how it needs to go together. So his critique of this artwork includes talking about how the fitting is too close. He thinks the S is a little too heavy, and the G is too light. But he thinks it has lots of potential. Griff writes back to him, I'm frankly of the opinion that this can be nothing else than a stunt face, and it is scalped. So then, years later, uh, here's a proof. They, they did take it into uh, the first stages of manufacturing, and then they abandoned it. So years later, uh, Hermann Zopf was visiting Rochester and had a conversation with Alexander Lawson, who showed him a stat of this. And Zopf, uh, Lawson wrote, Zopf could only shake his head at the coincidence of inspiration between himself and Dwiggins, 30 years and 4,000 miles apart. And although that's true, look at this alphabet from the same uh, paper letter set stuff from 1928. This is, again, a serifless Roman. You've got Albertus, which is a little different, certainly, than Optima. But uh, I'm glad that he was thinking about that. It's too bad he didn't carry it forward. But I'm very fond of Optima and think Zoff really made a masterpiece with that type. So now we get to 1930, and Paul Hollister puts together this book called American Alphabets, for which Dwiggins supplies the cover design, and there are also a number of pages of his work inside. So this alphabet was reproduced by Matthew Desmond, it's a digital font called Dwiggins Deco. And James Goggin has actually been using it for a whole series of books that he's designed, where he uses this for display on the covers and spines. And then he uses Electra and Metro for uh, the interior typography. So this lives on in the modern era. This is not type, but the letters have so much coolosity, I wanted you to see them anyway. This is two pages of his. Uh, his work in the inside of that book. So in the early 30s, imagine the business environment. The typewriter is everywhere. And typewriter types aren't that interesting. Underwood approaches him about doing something for personal correspondence. And Dwiggins wrote that he wanted to do a cursive based on the types of Aldous. Uh, aimed at social letters, home use, he even refers to junior league correspondence. So here are his first ideas. This has been crossed out, but this is pretty close to what he was thinking of. He's taking very, very careful notes all the way through and refining these over and over again. There's deep correspondence between him and Underwood about how they are going to make each letter in this. And here's a proof with some letters rejected, post out of a, of a typewritten sheet. Here is, the, for overall color, something typed with Underwood's final, not ever brought into production, but brought to this stage. Here's a blow up of it. It's curious that the O is perfectly round, and yet the C and the E are oval. I'm not quite sure why he didn't make the 
the O also an oval figure, but the type is very beautiful. I don't know how clearly you can see that, but that's a pencil drawing for an X with a little bit of modeling. Here he's beginning to play with, they, they've started refining the typewriter concept and they begin to have what they call three-step release, where the letters can be three different widths and the carriage advances by those widths rather than relentlessly always the same width. So as you look down this sheet, he's adding weight to them, but then at the bottom, A, N, U, and S are one width, I is a narrower width, and M is wider. And all through the 30s and 40s and, and into the early 50s, these typewriter companies were working with him about uh, trying to, to better the basic typewriter machinery in imitation of typeset. And here are an A and N, again, replete with all these figures, and he's, he's working here to divvy up, well, who's going to be the middle width, who's going to be wide, and who's going to be narrow in both the lowercase and the caps. So he played with, with this variable width stuff and with um, uh, unit width designs. This is something that he worked on with Linotype for United Business Machines. And here he's doing a much more modeled letter. And I'll show you later in the 1940s, late 40s, this typeface, Alexandria, which if you see that up at the top, and it's quite similar to what he was doing with the drawings for the model letters. And the bottom is just me faking what that might have been like struck through a typewriter ribbon on a piece of paper. By the end of the process, though, he's decided it's better to just let typewriter type honestly be typewritten and not have it try to imitate. Edwards Brothers, uh, they, they have this technology called near print where for things like doctoral theses that you couldn't afford to set in hot metal and then paginate and lock up and print just a few hundred copies of, sort of the, the equivalent of our on-demand digital printing that we have access to now. They were trying to come up with something called near print that would imitate typeset. And in the end, I think the witness decided no, let type be type, and let the typewriter just whack away with its uh, uniform widths. His friend and client, George Macy, with whom he did all of the books for the Limited Editions Club, had many irons in the fire, including being art director of a women's magazine published by the Hearst Empire called Pictorial Review. So here's the flag for that with that gorgeous CT Literature, lettered by Gibbons. This is a, uh, in the couple of years in the 1930s he was working on this. So again, Macy didn't want to have to send out for story headlines if they could do them in house. So he asked Gibbons, "Can you make some alphabets for us that we can print and then paste up?" And Gibbons said, "Sure." So here's a spread using the Roman. Here's one using the italic. Here's a combination of both. And so these are all rubber cemented, cut out and rubber cemented together onto a mechanical. The, uh, the uh, headlines are all a little over the top, I think, the story titles. He uses stencils as the basis for building up this alphabet. And here's the finished alphabet, made by filling in the bridges and, and cleaning everything up. The board of directors was curiously meddlesome. Dwiggins designed all these swash caps for Pretoria Review, and the board of directors was micromanaging the stuff, and in the, the first couple of months of 1935, these types appeared, and the board said, we don't like these characters. Dwiggins wrote up this huge poster, this is maybe two by three feet or even bigger, and the top two rows are the ones that got the board's seal of approval, and he's saying to Macy, 
what's wrong with the other ones? I don't really see that there's any difference. If they're complaining about the what he calls the blobs, the sort of ball terminals on the K and the T and the H, he said, those are present up above. Is it that they're too wide? And he never got an answer. And mysteriously, by March, April, May, his types, into which he had put so much effort, and they're beautiful types, they were phased out and never used again. So they only appeared for two or three months. Here's a, a close-up of, of all of his notes. That he's, he's, he's writing this plea to Macy. Why is this? I just don't understand these guys. And he wanted, I think one of his great attitudes is that he did not sit at his imperial drawing board and say, this is exactly how it's going to be, and if you don't like it, tough. He wanted a marriage with the client where everybody's happy, and he just couldn't get that with, with that organization. So, Charter. He's thinking, the, the way that the linotype machine works, if you have a, a duplex map, that means you have a Roman and an italic character on top of each other on the same map that comes down out of the magazine. Well, the italic F is by nature quite wide, and so you have the problem that the F is really narrow and the, the, uh, in the Roman and in the italic it's really wide. So he says, this is new, this non-slant ital, new in modern type at least. We can catch the advertising crowd. Let's make an italic that's upright. So this is his first concept of ink. Here's a, a decorated V, cap V. He only made uh, a, a few capital letters. Isn't this ampersand, the V's knees? I just love that. <laughs> Are these pencil drawings visible to everybody OK? I tried to play with Photoshop to increase the contrast a little bit. So now we're getting to the stage of fitting the lowercase, evaluating for color and side bearings and so forth. You can see there are only those three capital letters in the ampersand. And Linotype printed this proclamation, which is a, uh, a 1676 document about the first Thanksgiving held in Charlestown, Massachusetts. And Here's what it looks like in a more detailed setting. That's, uh, they used Electra for the uh, capital letters. And S.A. Jacobs, who was E.E. E. Cummings' personal printer, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Jacobs' work, but he was a polyglot. He spoke 14 languages or something like that. And he was the only person that Cummings felt comfortable working with, because Cummings was working on a typewriter and Jacobs could properly interpret in uh, hand type, or I don't know that he was using hand type or machine composition, but anyway, Jacobs was the only one that Cummings felt could get what he was trying to do with space when Cummings' work was typeset. Well, he also did a couple of books for Dwiggins. The types are not credited, but in this case, Charter was carried forward enough that they could actually set type with it. And so the, uh, the Golden Eagle Press issued this uh, story of Ocasin Nicolette in charter. Again, using uh, Electra small caps. And then Sibylla Hagman created her Odile type a few years ago using charter as an inspiration. So this type is living on in a new form. And by the way, in addition to the dummy of the biography, I've brought a, a bunch of the books. These experimental types were often produced far enough along that they could typeset a whole book and print it. But Linotype decided never to bring them into full commercial production. So there are several types that I'm talking about tonight represented in printed form up here on the, on the table. I should also say that every type design at Linotype was called an experimental. Even the ones like Caledonia and Electra that had great success commercially began as experimental numbers such and such. And this was manufactured to some degree, but I wanted to group it with these guys tonight because it never had the kind of widespread usage that Linotype's other 
the, the legibility group had these types such as Excelsior that dominated newspaper production worldwide. And Linotype really started out as a newspaper machine. It was a kind of rough and ready, fast way to set galleys of type for the newspaper. And the book world looked askance at it and thought, well, that's kind of not quite up to the standards of Monotype. And one of the reasons that Linotype hired Dwiggins was they thought he could bring some cachet to their offering of types. And not only would they be reviving Baskerville and Jansen and so forth, but that they could originate some types and have Dwiggins design them. So Chauncey Griffith pretty, pretty much owned the newspaper, uh, the legibility group. He, he so told Dwiggins usually, you, you just kind of stay away, stay over in your corner and work on your regular book types. But he did invite him to work on this Hingham project. And the idea here was to make a seven-point type that was as readable as possible in this really horrific environment of low contrast, rough newsprint that's very absorbent. We've got this thin ink that's not even really black. How do you make that readable as, po as, readable as possible? So here's the color of it. It started out as newsface. And then later to honor Dwayne's, the line had changed the name to Hingham. <coughs> So here are four drawings of some H's. So he starts out, he's got one on the left. Notice that the serifs at the bottom have this combination of a kind of tapered slab on one side and then this perfect curve bracket on the other side. Then he thinks, well, OK, maybe we'll make the strokes a little thinner. And then here's two more. Now he goes back to the strokes being fatter, and the serifs at the bottom are all slab with a taper. And then he goes to the fourth one. He goes back to the kind of hybrid serif, but he puts a really sharp angle into it. And this is the much valued M formula that everybody uh, talks about. I think it's important to clarify that Dwiggins never expected this to be used in display type or even in nine or 10 point. What he saw was that as he was building his marionettes, the very round, natural contours that he carved in the early 30s didn't read as well from the audience as the later faces that had these very sharp angles. And he suddenly realized, well, maybe I can put a sharp angle like that somewhere in the counter of the type. And although the reader won't actually see it, it will change in the same way that ink traps work in a later generation of phototype. It will change the nature of the printed character. So, and here's a G using that same process. He also played with Greek types. He made three different designs. Argo was a standalone, incredibly gorgeous type that I'll show you in a minute. Jason was meant as a companion for his El Dorado type that he was developing during the 1940s, although it wasn't released until the 1950s. And Stentor, named for the herald of the Greek army in the Trojan War, was the companion for the Hingham, uh, the newsface, newspaper type. So usually Griff did the fitting. Dwiggins figured out the basic letter shapes, and then Griff and Linotype worked on all the side bearings to get the fitting exactly right. But sometimes Wiggins thought about this stuff, too. So here's a pencil drawing uh, with him thinking about exactly how the spacing ought to fall. Here's Argo. And this is my inking in these letters. In the Boston Public Library are all the original pencil drawings. So I brought, photographed them, brought them into Photoshop, changed levels, and then very carefully filled in as if I were using a rapidograph at first and then a, a larger brush to give you an idea of what the letters would look like uh, when printed. There are a couple of drawings of pi. Sigma, middle of the word and, and end of the word. Here is uh, an alpha made for stentor. And he's also thinking about all of the diacritical marks. Dwiggins' mother was a musician. She was in a famous 
my acapella octet that toured all around Ohio and Indiana when he was a little kid. She was uh, a brilliant pianist and organist, and so he grew up in this household that was just filled with music. And he actually wrote a piece that's reproduced in the back of the biography comparing printer's ornament to music and talking about harmony, counterpoint, rhythm, all this kind of stuff. So he was very interested in making types that could express music. And here are a, a series of notes. He, he did some professional work designing sheet music, but this is another thing where he wished that he could have his type realized in final manufactured form, and it, and it never happened. He's writing all these notes about the essentially Germanic tradition of uh, printing sheet music and saying, well, OK, if you look here, those quarter notes uh, are held together in a kind of blob, and it's harder for the musician to, to parse those. And if you look in the upper right corner, you see Dwiggins' idea that the quarter notes would be separate and distinct, one from the other, and it more clearly expresses what the composer wants the musician to do in that moment. Here are the half notes. He says, why not shift the emphasis of the oval around so that there's more contrast? And as the staff line runs through the middle, you instantly see what that is. Whereas the one on the left, it's a little harder to make that out. More uh, criticism of the traditional way of doing it. Here he's wanting to create a very light feeling in the music through the way that he's generating these notes. Give it a, a kind of sunnier, easier position on the paper, not quite so ponderous. Here's some of the sheet music that he designed for a client. And in the 1950s, when Dorothy Abbey had come to work for him, and they had this private press called Futurschein Hingham, she convinced him to get out a woodblock that he had made, a series of woodblocks that he made in 1921 of Petrushka. And the music on the left was printed from a photo engraving, but the photo engraving was made from the paste up. And look at this. For any of you that are ancient enough to have worked with um, pasting up mechanicals, I think it's incredible that it looks as good as it does in the printed form because of. Uh, all of the retouching that he did here, and, and the wiggles. He had a lot of palsy at this point, and didn't, didn't have a steady hand anymore. But it's fun to see the, the mechanical for this. He grew up in a town in southeastern Ohio called Cambridge, and the local newspaper wanted him to work on a new format for them, and he also was interested in, in creating some new headline types. He hadn't thought about this since 1928. This is now 20 years later. So his notes about this first set are easy to read, but probably too strange for the trade. Mm -hmm. Next, the top line says, here I'm trying a direct design to condensed mind, too much like what we already have. Then for the middle one, more condensation helps. And then for the bottom one, but modify further, heavier stems, less Z height, rectangular junction. He goes on now to play with some forms where the, the uh, there are cabal terminations there on the S's. So you have both uh, very straight line intersections in some places and, and curvy ones elsewhere. And if you look at the left of that top line, that first word allies has a kind of picket fence effect. And the lower headline reflects that, a more uniform width than, than what you see in the upper right. And here is that headline from the upper right in place on the newspaper as he's working up this new format. Here's a rely on proof of that headline and also the beautiful artwork that he created. And when the town was celebrating its sesquicentennial, he made this artwork and it appeared only one day. 
They printed a single edition of the newspaper with this as the flag at the top. I went to Cambridge in 2011 to give a talk about Dwiggins, and he had pretty much disappeared from the institutional memory of the town. They claimed William Boyd, who was the actor for Hopalong Cassidy, and John Glenn, who grew up in the next town over, not even their town. So I was really pleased to bring Dwiggins back and have everybody realize what a great artist their town produced. Okay, brief seventh inning stretch. Kara asked me to go longer than 45 minutes, and what I would hope is that you guys, I'm not going to play Sweet Caroline because it's New York, not Boston, but can you guys just wiggle for a second because I have a bunch more things to show you, and I just want to get the blood flowing. Excellent work, excellent. So, this picture from the 1890s is a bunch of high school pals. And Dwiggins' future wife, Mabel, is on the left. Dwiggins is in the center, in the front row. And these guys call themselves the Pretty Tough Gang. And they <laughs> explore around out in the countryside surrounding Cambridge and collected wildflowers and wrote poetry. And they just had a wonderful time together and stayed good friends through their, through their lives. So here are Bill and Mabel uh, still in high school. Then they've gotten married. They've just moved into a house uh, on Union Street in Hingham. So this is about 1905, maybe. Here they are, dressed to the nines a year later, also in Hingham. Uh, in the back, in the center, is Dwiggins young cousin, Larry Siegfried. And if any of you know the work of um, the fabulous that Dwiggins and Siegfried did, the cousins made these serial comic publications that were supposedly published by the Kirchhein brothers. And so uh, Siegfried uh, graduated from Harvard, hung out with Dwiggins, shared studio space with him, and then went on to work at Linotype, and then became head of the graphic design department at the Syracuse School of Journalism. So he stayed in printing. And uh, this is in the, their backyard in Hingham. This is a few years later, maybe at the end of World War I, Wiggins is uh, temporarily head of Harvard University Press. Much more serious now, sometime in the, in the 20s or the early 30s. Not so serious. Stills from a home movie taken at a picnic out in the backyard. And here is the pretty tough gang again, at least the three male members in the early 1950s, all those years later, and then Mabel on the right. And the, the other two women sitting are the wives of, of these guys. And the one on the left went back to Cambridge and became the publisher of the Daily Jeffersonian. This after he was one of the founders of AA, along with Henry Ford and some other people. So he had a very accomplished career elsewhere and then came back to uh, publish the local paper. So, okay, end of intermission. Now we, we go on to some more types. Here's Arcadia which is another one that was never brought to completion, and it's just so gorgeous. He and Linotype wanted to produce something for high-quality brochures and advertising. They were wanting to compete with Eve and Cochin, although I think Arcadia, these, these both have a lot of personality, but I think Arcadia is eminently more readable than either of these. And Dwiggan said of this type, it needs to be round and crisp, like the new moon one day out, a trimming of Diana's toenail. <laughs> so here's an H.A. drawing. Here's a proof beginning to show all of these revisions that have gone on during the very productive year of 1942, revising characters. And now they're getting into fitting. So this is seeming as if it's going to go ahead, but it's World War II. Metal is in short supply. The resources are, are being directed in other places. People that make you know, Lionel trains, those, those guys made uh, telegraph keys instead of trains, because that's what was needed for the war effort. And Lionel just couldn't bring all these designs to fruition. 
Here's a close-up of the type as set using text from one of Dwiggins' uh, short stories. Look at that cue in the second line. So I hope somebody takes that up. All the, all the stuff is, is available in either the linotype shop drawings or the stuff in the files at uh, Boston Public Library. So somebody make Arcadia someday. Mm -hmm. Winchester began, he hand-lettered one of his Apollinthia stories for an issue of The Dolphin, a, a fine printing book in 1935, did the whole thing in a nutshell hand, in calligraphy. And he thought, let's make type out of this. And the first they called it, the working name was Canterbury. So these are some very early sketches. Here's some in ink, still thinking about this uh, anchoal form mixing in with the regular Roman forms. You see the K in the top line and the F in the bottom line, cap T and H in the top line over to the right. But he's also thinking, well, let's make a straight Roman, not just an anchoal. Let's do both. And another gorgeous ampersand. He decides to call the one that's got the blend of anchoal forms in it Winchester English, and the other one is called Winchester Roman. I actually think it's more successful in this italic form, mixing them up. But here are the completed alphabets, so that you can see the contrast between the lower cases. And now I ask you, to look at these, Winchester English on top and Winchester Roman underneath. If these are, are these readable enough for you guys to be able to see the difference in the letters or are they too small from the back of the row? I love Wiggins, but for all these decades that I've been looking at his work, I just can't understand why he thought this would be more readable than the Roman. And he, he said about this, he, he wrote and said, uh, there's no reason to fear that the printing trade will trample out valuable lives in its stampede to adopt this or any other revision of English. No trade is more conservative than the printing trade. So uh, it was a great idea, and he, he promoted it for as long as he was alive. He, he thought it was great. He kept saying the serenity of Latin. You know, let's do away with the ascenders and descenders, and the type will then be so much easier to read. Well. I just don't think it is. Here is Winchester Roman, so that you can see that in detail. And Walter Tracy, in Letters of Credit, said he thought this was one of the finest type designs, text type designs of the 20th century. And uh, Jim Spies out in Indianapolis made, maybe 20 years ago, uh, which I do see Winchester. So this is available digitally, and I think it's a very good interpretation. It doesn't suffer. A lot of the time when you see revivals, they're a little bit scrawny, and the Winchester keeps the color of the, uh, the original metal. So Dwiggins used it in a book called The Glistening Hill that uh, he and Dorothy published in 1950 for Peter Schenkel. And S.A. Jacobs again used it in this Harlequinish interpretation, and that's over on the table. Think about how difficult it would be to set up these forms in the chase so that everything lines up properly. There's six colors on this page. And again, I just not only is the, the Winchester not appealing to my eye, but too many colors. So have a look at that. And the stencil book that is over here that uh, Princeton Arch Architectural Press just reprinted was also set in Winchester. The type in that is, is uh, set by Dorothy by hand. Linotype very kindly, even though they didn't uh, manufacture the face, cast enough sorts of uh, Roman and Italic in both styles so that um, Dwiggins and Abbey could use it for hand composition in their own shop. I thought it was really classy of Linotype to do that. Okay, Times Roman was supposed to just be a newspaper face, but look at what happened. All the job printers, everybody, started going mad for it. And Linotype thought, are we going to have to pay for a license for Times Roman, or can we come up with something that will compete with it? So here they're comparing the dark 
H's and I's are their 267D, and then they're comparing it to two old styles, Caledonia and Bookman. You're just kind of looking at the, the color of the type. Here's an A drawing where Dwiggins is worried about the metallic A, which is duplexed on the same map, needing more width because the A is slanted. Can we make, gracefully make an A that's just a little bit more wide body so that it, it duplexes better with the, the italic? I think Linotype was very pleased that he was so mechanically inclined and wanting to make their work easier rather than saying, well, here's my art, make it, make it happen. So here's a proof of the 267. It has lovely color. Here is 267 on top and times underneath. And I think just as Metro had many qualities, but people were so infatuated with Futura that in the end, Linotype had to come out with Spartan to imitate Futura because nobody wanted to buy Metro. Times just had so much attractive force already in the marketplace. In the end, Linotype abandoned this and licensed Times and, and sold its client, its customers, uh, Times. Here are Dwiggins' notes about comparing 267D to Plantin. This nine point is as legible as 10 Plantin. These caps are better than 10 Plantin. <laughs> this fitting is better than Plantin's fitting, i.e. 267 looks smoother running, but it came to naught. He was uh, flipping through Opdyke's printing types book and discovered a type that Rosart had used in 1750 or 60 that he really liked. And he thought, I'm going to make a new type based on, on this for inspiration. He also looked at an italic from the Zalta foundry uh, produced in 1794. And he began playing with these things, saying he was after a uh, kind of metal punch quality and a certain well-fed robustness. And here's a, a tracing. He, he had photographs made of Rosart's printed types. And they enlarged these, and then he made tracings of them as his sort of point of departure for Stuyvesant. So here's a proof partway through. They're playing with fitting. They're looking at color. They're intending to go ahead with this. This is, again, 1942. Here's the final alphabet as made. And Dwiggin says about it, uh, I'm getting a new swing in a book phase with lots of action and a promising fusing or blending quality in word formation. Again, it has lovely color, I think. Do the, if you look at the second line, do the lowercase letters look as if they have a larger X height to you guys than the Roman? It's interesting, maybe because there's so much illumination from inside the counters, they feel bigger on the body than the Roman to me. Uh, here is a book that you'll see over here called Shirley Letters that Knopf published. A few books were done this time. Bodoni. He wanted to pay honor. He wanted to honor Bodoni in some way. And here you have the Manuale Typographico. And I've enlarged this page on the left. And what Dwiggins was critical of was all of the modern Bodoni revivals, early 20th century revivals, that were very stolid and foursquare and had no energy in them. He said, one trouble of the Bodonis when they get together into words is the mathematical rigidity, ruled lines and compass curves. But the main action trouble is in the spring of the arches and loop elements away from the stems. In all the modern Bodonis, this motion is always ugly, all the fawn-like grace of a galloping cow. <laughs> so he starts playing with, how can I get energy into these letters? Look at that counter. So 
So now he's reduced, he's, he's not been quite as exaggerated in the, the samba effect in that powder, but it's still there in this G. Here's the alphabets. He talks about having a swelled stem, such as a soft pen makes, a stem not too rigid, motion in it. And here's a comparison that Linotype printed with Tippecanoe on the top and Bodomi on the bottom. And I have an enlargement that you can see in a second. So when you look at these in real life, you feel this kind of vibration coming out of Tippecanoe. In truth, maybe there's too much energy in it, but it's such a wonderful um, departure from these very stolid interpretations. When, when you see real Bodoni printing, and then you see what people like ATF and, and uh, Monotype were doing in the early 20th century, they just have no zest. Uh, his friend Elizabeth Coatsworth, who was a noted children's author, and her husband was Henry Beston, who wrote The Outermost House, Naturalist. They were both members of his marionette troupe and good friends. So she wrote a book of quite dark poems, and they used Tippecanoe to uh, uh, set that, and that's over on the table. He played around in the late 40s with a type called Adventure. This was never brought into the full character set. He's just goofing around with ideas. and. Uh, he, he's really interested in what he calls action. And when you look at this cap A, there's just all this swing and action in it. And this is a very faithful rendering of his pencil drawing. That crossbar in the A has some undulations in it. Whether those are just his being imprecise or whether he wanted them to be there, I don't know. But I, I carried that through when I, when I inked in this character. This E has a, a bunch of really interesting asymmetrical parts to it. Here's the F character inked in, and then a detail of the original drawing, where you can see that this intersection has three chamfered brackets, and then one perfectly rounded bracket. So, and he has these kind of blobby terminals that he's, he's now enamored of. And you'll see those in the next type also. Here's the K. So it's tantalizing to see him working these out. And then he, he kind of leaves this behind and goes into the, the next design, Alexandria. And he, he said to Dorothy Abbey, this is the result of the studies we made for a Greek face. The idea being to see what would happen if the Roman forms were written in the Greek style of modeling. In the city of Alexandria, the Greek and Roman currents met and mixed up pretty extremely. In the thin paper state, it looks like it might be something. And for any of you who went to Dwiggins' studio where Dorothy lived, in the dark room, what used to be the marionette workroom, there was a big enlargement of this up on the wall. And I, Inspired by that, I was 22 when I saw that, and I went home and took a roll of Yellow Trace, and there's a quote from uh, a letter that uh, Darn Hunter wrote to Harrison Elliott in the middle of the Depression that says, I sometimes wish I had a good steady position in an A&P store. This is in 1933 or something like that. And I put that up on my studio <laughs> wall, inspired by this. Here he's playing with some variations on one letter. Roman and metallic H's. What a cool metallic H that is. Here are the three states of Alexandria. The top one is 1946. I, I wish I could show you the whole alphabet, but you can imagine how long it takes to work on each one of these letters. So this is as many as I was able to produce. The ones in the middle are from 1948, and the ones on the bottom are from 1949. So, what he's doing, the 1946 is thinner in color, 48 is fatter, and it begins to lean to the right a little bit. And then in 49, he goes back to a slightly slenderer stroke weight, and he has club terminals. If you look at the lowercase m, they, they all have 
that rounded profile, whereas in 1948, it's straight on the bottom. Really interesting alternate G, which he refers to as a compact G. But to me, it's not that much narrower than the other G. It's just hard to figure out what it is. OK. He said, since the fellers are all yelling for mechanical, non-human letters, one might meet them full face with a type that had nothing human, i.e. calligraphic, about it at all, at all. This is pure straight edge and compass, with no trace of hand-drawn curves. The A and the E haven't found their centers yet, but the H and I show what might be done. He used stencils uh, a lot in developing his type designs. These are some that he cut for charter. Uh, used hacksaw blades, made his own knives out of uh, hacksaw blades, and, and then cut the celluloid and acetate. Acetate was too hygroscopic, so he ended up using celluloid, which by now has largely shattered. So most of the stencils in the files are, are broken. Here is a workup for that 1928 oil stem done with stencils. But he didn't just use them for type design. He also said, I'm going to make stencils for their own sake. So this is his type called Imperial. And Paul Wagner made this lovely jacket for the reprint of Dorothy's stencil book. That's over on the table using that uh, alphabet. Here are some more. And lucky recipients got these envelopes that were festooned with all this uh, stencil artwork. And a few decorated initials just to wind up. This one's from 1928. It's the first time that he used multiple colors. So done in black and white and then sent off for photo engraving. So this was actually printed from three different cuts. Here are three of many decorated initials from the 1932 Limited Editions Club edition of Balzac's Droll Stories. This is in the files at the BPL. I have no idea what date it is, but it's work in progress. It's the whole alphabet, but some of the characters are just penciled in and he's begun to, to work them up again. Purely calligraphic, handwritten on the left, all stencil on the right. And this is a broadside that he did for Eastern Paper. Uh, and I think this is the ne plus ultra of his decorated initials. So Dwiggins had two great friends through his whole career. Carl Rollins and Rudolf Rizika. They complained to each other, uh, triumphed to each other, wrote letters back and forth, visited. They were great friends. And, and uh, Rizika said of Dwiggins, very early in his career, Dwiggins became fascinated by the symbols that speak. By long training, letter forms just naturally came to flow from his fingers. Type always lurks in his calligraphy, and he demonstrates this most strikingly in the numerous designs where both hand lettering and types are used, and where the lettering, be it ever so free, and the fixed type forms merge in perfect agreement. The result primarily of native genius, but also of intensive practice and of wide theoretical study of letter forms. Thus he can span the range from the severely classical to the grotesque, from the sturdily formal to the palely tenuous, tucking a jesting feather or flourish in a letter now and then, without once puzzling the reading eye. The basic anatomy of the letter is always there. Thank you very much.